I miss that we're a week behind? Not or? really. Like, I mean, no. Uh, because the, the way that the, the class, the way that I've decided, to, in, instead of like insisting that everyone start the class at the same time and work their way through, people drop in and drop out as their schedules allow. And so some people start at unit one and go to unit whatever, how many there are. Uh, there are eight units. So people start at unit one and go through unit eight. Other people start at unit six and then do six, seven, eight, and then one, two, eight. That's it. So. so we're actually right now in uh, we're in Roman numeral two, um, section B. Uh, we've been going through the restrictions of that. So we talked about the history of the Torah, the history of Jewish law. Um, that was Roman number one, and we discussed Shabbat, the Sabbath, and the positive ways of observing the Sabbath, Kiddush, and Sabbath meals, and the, all of the, like Mitzvah say, the affirmative commands. And then we've been discussing all of the restrictions on Shabbat, that's letter B in Yom Rimmel 2. And you were going through, I think in the last, our last class, you went through all of the 39 categories of labor that the rabbis identified as the primary things that are forbidden on Shabbat, and we are working through I think each of them. Does that sound familiar to you? Yeah, that was you? the last class I was at. Good. That, that was the last class there was, okay? So that's where we're up to right now. So we're sort of in the middle of, room of letter B. Um, um, sort of... There was another class that I didn't attend it. So there's only that, one, there was one, um, what's your face? Um, it, was it, was, it was also on the Shabbat, on Shabbat right? The, all, all the rules? No, no, no that, that class, um, there was only one student, and we had a lot of other things to discuss, so we didn't, uh, re so, oh, we, so we didn't oh, advance yeah. in the curriculum, and we didn't record that class, because it was, it. So, okay. okay. So, I'll just use my handy, handy look to just uh, Quick administrative yeah, question. Sure. Is it, so is it, does it proceed along this curriculum on like a weekly basis? Is there a... That's the other thing. We don't, we don't, we meet, we meet one to three times per month, but it's not quite as regular as I would like because um, they're like holidays and sometimes I'm traveling, you know, just it's this, sure. since I'm the teacher and there's like other things going on, um, it just can't be quite as regular as I would like. So often on Monday or Tuesday, <laughs> Monday or Tuesday evenings, um, one to three times per month is when we meet. Great. If you miss a class, it's, it'll be recorded, um, and you can watch it online if that's helpful. And um, again, just say, you know, if you're taking the class as part of a conversion program, then you should also addition schedule an uh, individual meeting with me every three to six weeks, just to like okay. have a chance to like supplement the class with like some touching base and talking. Um, and we can also do other book reading assignments and come to shul and meet people and stuff like that. Cool. Should we jump on an email list, or is just so yes, we know you when be, one to three times? Yes, 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 yes. You should both be getting emails from the shul if you. Um, I. Do you get weekly emails from the shul? I want no. Or. Um. Probably not. Right. No, not yet. I get so, like Facebook events, but I don't. I haven't gotten. Fine. So let me. What's what's each of your? You know, let me just take that right now. What's what's your email address? S M S M C H C H U R I U R I at Gmail at Gmail. Great. And you are? Lauren, L-A-U-R-E-N, dot O-L-E-S, two, at Gmail. Okay. So I'll add you both right now, actually. Just so I don't forget. Thank you. Um, please add to email list. Okay. So you'll get, at this point, um, one to three times a week, an email from the show from the synagogue office saying things that are happening. And you are welcome to attend anything and everything that interests you. Uh, including these classes will be advertised as well. And the bulletin, you get a bulletin every week, you can look at the bulletin and see what's going to happen. So please come to that. Okay. Um, okay. Um, no, no, it's good, it's good. They were asking this question we last week. So. <laughs> okay. So, jumping right in. <laughs> there are, the, the rabbis identified 39, review for you. The rabbis identified 39 principal categories of labor, um, types of activity that are this is not true because this isn't really one of these. Uh, this is sort of like letter two, a, a number two within letter B. I don't know number two. So you write to like the biblical acts of prohibition, the avot, the central categories, which have tolado, which have subcategories. That's how they organize all of the things you can't do on Shabbat. They, they categorize them into these 39, I don't know, uh, central categories, uh, which then have subcategories, okay? 
Um, and all of this is to carve out a space for all the positive, nice things about Shabbat, to have a day of rest, a day of community, a day of prayer, uh, a day of family. In order to have that space, the restrictions like give us that, that space. Um, to have a, um, if a day just of recreation, a day you'll end up feeling like busy work, you'll end up spending, you'll travel, you'll, you'll be diffuse, but if everyone is kind of rooted in their places and no one's traveling, and no one's involved in commerce, uh, then people can spend time in community and family and like get in touch with themselves and kind of uh, contemplation and relaxing in, in a very deep way. So all of these restrictions, the nuts and bolts, they're, can be, they are very, very detailed, but they're about creating something really positive and creating space and time for that really positive thing. Um, so I think we went through a whole bunch of the first maybe 11 of those categories of labor. If you recall, we went through, and maybe we didn't go through all, we didn't go through all 11, which we turned into. We did, we did plowing, we did planting, we did um, reaping, we did keeping, we did threshing, we did winnowing, and we did sorting, seven. Do we do token grinding? Yeah. We did grinding also, very good. Very tiny um, garlic. <laughs> right, good. Maracade is, um, is another form of sifting which is very similar to the, okay? Um, lush, we can do that. That's kneading, okay? Yeah. Kneading. After you have your ground flour and you've sifted it again to get it, you know, the, the bran from the white part of the flour, the next step in making bread is kneading the dough. So any type of kneading is forbidden on Shabbat. So kneading dough, obviously. Other things that might be kneading um, could be other just examples, like, uh, I don't know if you can't make clay on Shabbat. Right? Maybe you can't make Play-Doh on Shabbat. Uh, yeah? Is, what is, how do you make clay? Is it just spilling water on some sort of a mortar-esque? Yeah, so exactly. So it's taking some sort of powdery substance, mixing it with liquid, and then, you know, kneading it. Does, yeah. that, does that apply to any other change of state? So good, it very good question. To ice to very it? good question. Water to ice is a separate issue, but the questions that come up that have to be evaluated would be things like, um, what about mushing? Uh, banana to feed to a baby. Mm. What about making oatmeal from like instant oatmeal? What about these? Are, right, these are all subject to rabbinic debate and discussion. Wash drying. Exactly. Exactly. What about making uh, tuna salad? What about making guacamole? Okay. Is that is that under like mashing? Is mashing vegetables under that? What about making chocolate? Butter? Okay. You know, it, it's a food preparation that's sort of similar to kneading dough, but also kind of different in some ways. So. These categories have to be defined, and this is, you know, what these books are about. But, but like, those are very, it's a very good question, okay? Um, the main category is kneading dough, that's sort of the most obvious one. Next is, um, next is, is bishol, which we're going to go back and talk about in its own right, because it's one of the most important, and that's cooking itself, okay? So any, which is defined here as transforming something through heat to make it better uh, to eat, okay? It's, a, like, it's sort of hard, like, what is cooking? It's, it's not so simple. Um, but the basic definition of cooking here is transforming to eat. We were supposed to have really good food on Shabbat, supposed to have a wonderful meal, a warm meal, but the cooking is done before. Uh, we don't cook on Shabbat. So it's about putting in the effort beforehand on Thursday, on Friday, so that on Shabbat we can just sort of enjoy ourselves and enjoy the people we're with without the, the effort of the cooking itself. Cooking's all done beforehand. Um, but the definition and the delineations of that is quite detailed. That'll be the next. We'll talk about that next once we get through all the yeah. Um, yeah, we'll talk about that. Oh. It's very complicated. Okay? Meaning, some people, you know, in the ancient world, there was, there was some who said, we'll just eat cold food on Shabbat. And the rabbi said, no, uh, you should eat warm food, but there are ways to have warm food that don't come into, that don't violate this prohibition. Okay. We'll talk about that next. Because, okay, let's, let's go on. So that's the first, that's the whole first series that is like 11, is that right? Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. The first eleven milachot, the first eleven main categories of labor, are all culminating in bread. Okay, culminating in, in, in you, you, you plowed, you planted, you reaped, etc., etc., etc. You made bread, you baked it. That is the first eleven of the thirty-nine milachot. Right. So again, it's all it's about basic needs. How do you? What do we do during the week to sustain ourselves? To make civilization, to feed ourselves, to clothe ourselves, etc. Those are things we don't do on Shabbat, because Shabbat, we live in the world that God created, we live in the world that we've transformed, that we've made, but we don't shape the world on Shabbat, we just inhabit the world 
as we prepared it. That's also the different stance of it, right? So, okay. Next. Uh, writing is forbidden on Shabbat. Writing? Writing. You're right, I'm gonna race. That that, that's similar to the laws of Shabbat, right? That was the same book that you showed? Yeah, this, this is the book. This is not a book. This is a book that goes through. It's, it's a very good book. It's, it's not quite practical for. It's, it's, like a, it's a five volume. It's a massive book. So it's yeah. a great book if you want to learn about the laws of Shabbat in great detail. It's not. The books that I recommended are a little laws more. Of Shabbat. A, a little, a little, I started on the first they're volume. It's a two volume book that's much more practical, like what to do. I this see. is much more theoretical. Oh, okay. Uh, I'm using because it has a list of the order on the spine, that's why I'm looking yeah, at it. Yeah, I didn't come across it yet. Next, we get out the writing for now, I guess, because that's the, I, I looked at the books out of order, so. Okay. Um, Gozes, um, shearing a sheep, okay, cutting the wool off a sheep. Again, we don't do many of these things in our daily life, but, uh, but likewise, similar to Gozes, we don't shear a sheep, but you might, um, what might you do that's similar to shearing a sheep? Cutting hair, good. What else? Cutting hair, excellent. Excellent. It's exactly the same. Uh, although it's a little bit different because when you shear a sheep, what's your intention? You want the wall. Good. When you cut your hair, you get rid of the exactly. hair. Exactly. So that means it's only rabbinic prohibition. Okay. It's not the biblical definition. Is you cut off the wool because Harvest you value. want your exactly, exactly. When you cut your hair, it's the opposite. Okay. Uh, so what else might you do? Even like without meaning, meaning to. If you if you use like a oh shaving. Brush. No. Good. Brush. Shaving for sure. You might if you use a brush or comb, you might pull out hairs without even intending to, okay. and that's a class to be discussed. Brushing a pet. Brushing a pet. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Especially like you get all that hair out. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Again, you're not you're not harvesting the wool in those cases usually, but so it may only be rabbinic, like a lesser um, severity, but uh, it's still it's still the, um, the same category. Okay. So shearing next. Malabin. Malabin is. Um, um, uh, cleaning, like cleaning, laundering, whitening the wool after you've sheared it. So this is any kind of laundering is basically under this category. So you can't launder. If you've got a stain on your shirt, you do some wine spills on your shirt, you can't pour seltzer on it, you can't wash out at the stain uh, on Shabbat. We don't launder things on Shabbat. Uh, you can, uh, if you have like something dry, you can sort of brush off some dirt off yourself, but you can't put water and like wash something off on Shabbat. Okay, that's all under this category, because the next stage of, of dealing with the wool was to wash it. Next, uh, manafets. Manafets means to comb out the wool, right? You have a tangle of wool that you've sheared off your sheep, you have to kind of comb it. I don't know if you've ever seen this, like we've gone to like, uh, um, Williams, we're right back east, they have all these places, I don't know if it's a thing here, in, in the east coast where I'm from, they have all of these um, little like, villages where they reenact like uh, colonial times, like the, 18th century life, so that place like that here. We at least have medieval times. We do, we're a little different. This is nice. so they have like, when they have a, in, in Sturbridge, Massachusetts, and Bethpage, New York, they have like these, and um, Mystic Seaport, uh, Mystic Connecticut, they have these like 18th century or 19th century like little villages where they do things like this. Uh, yeah, yeah, so you, you, you take the wool, you sort of comb it out to, to get all the strands and fibers like in the line. Next, you do, um, oh yeah, so they are. So they are is you dye it color the wool, right? You you can't color anything, you can't dye anything on Shabbat. So you can't, I don't know, I will, you can't dye something, you can't, you can't make something from like color. arts and crafts. Arts right? and crafts, most arts and crafts. Um, yeah, exactly, like if you wanted to. You can't paint or draw. Paint, exactly, painting would all fall under that. Painting, absolutely, absolutely. It seems like a lot of these are like using some sort of labor to add value to an asset. Yes. Um, is there a sense in which these are all kind of connected? In, in this yes, sort? yes, and 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 the, the Talmud talks about lechet machshev. All of these things are um, like deliberative, constructive activities. If you do all of them in a destructive way, it's not a biblical violation. So if you color something in a way that ruins it, mm. like if you pour, so I can spill yeah, grape juice, like, but I can't clean it out. If you're angry, you know, like an angry, like pour grape juice on something, like you ruin the shirt, like. That would not be a biblical violation of Shabbat. But not if Kandinsky does it. Right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. That's all the art, right? So, it's, so it's, it's, if you, all of these things are only prohibitions. It's, it's all about, again, adding value about productive activity. 
Um, so here it's all like how you make fabric, how you, from the sheep to your garments, all the stages that are necessary. So the dyeing of the wool to make it into a color for, your, you know, for a garment, that would be positive enhancing. If you were to color something in a way that ruins it, that would not be. Not to derail too much, but is, no. it, is it sort of like, from a framework perspective, can you think of it as sort of investment versus consumption? Possibly. Let's Six days of investment, one day of consumption. Yeah, that works. I would, I would think about, I would, uh, six days God created, six days we work, we do things, and then on Shabbat we consume. Um, I think that works. Consuming though has, at least in like a consumer, it like has the ethos, as like the connotes like buying and purchasing and being involved in the economy. And Shabbat, you're like, it's almost like you're inhabiting in yeah. a sort of passive way. So you're enjoying life, you're enjoying things around you, but you're not purchasing. So, whereas consumption has often connotes economic activity. Shabbat is like, I mean, I guess everything's economic, but it's, it's about no you're sort of living more passively within the world. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, so dyeing is forbidden. Can't dye, can't change colors of anything. Um, next comes Tovet. Tovet is um, uh, spinning, spinning the wool into yarn. Okay. Not too many other examples of things that fall into that category, uh, but uh, sewing. is different. This is spinning. Spinning is it? Spinning is one. Sewing. Sewing. We'll get to sewing. We'll get to sewing. Don't, don't jump ahead. Spinning. Spinning is when you take. Spinning is when you take the the, the, the tufts of wool. And you turn into thread or yarn, yeah. and that's spinning. Um, mesach is when you take that thread, the, the yarn, and you put it, you make it into a loom. You kind of you spread the, you know, the warp and the woof. The, I forget which one is which, but you kind of take the yarn and you, you, you spread it onto a loom. That's called mesach. That's also a step. Next is um, which is also one of these weaving stages. I don't exactly know what it is. And then comes Oreg, which is actually weaving. So there are like three different of these 39 melachot that are all various stages of setting up a loom and, and operating that loom and actually doing the weaving. I don't really know how to use a loom. I haven't done it in a long time. So I don't really know exactly what these are. These are not really, um, these don't have too many other applications. Um, there for the most part, used to create something that you would use in a trade. Type Correct, but it's just a bit specific to like weaving, which is not got something it. that I do very much of. Okay, got it. Okay. I think got it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. um, Potsea is that when you cut the fabric off the loom and you're done. Okay, so that might be, Thomas talks about crushing things open, that might also be, uh, you know, the same category. Um, kosher. Kosher is tie the knot. You can't tie knot in Shabbat if it's a complicated craftsman's knot, like the knot that a sailor would use, you know, like a very, you know, um, a knot that a camel driver would use to tie this camel in a special way. Those types of, like, professional knots are forbidden to tie in Shabbat. A simple bow knot that you tie in your shoe is permissible. A simple knot you put on your necktie, according to most, is also permissible. So much tricks about neckties on Shabbat. Most of us use neckties on Shabbat. Because it's, we say it's not a professional knot, it's not a permanent knot, it's just a simple, I think there are some more fancy ways of tying neckties that I've never learned, which are forbidden on Shabbat, like a double Wilson, does that sound familiar? Windsor. Windsor, whatever, yeah, double Windsor. I think you can't do a double Windsor on Shabbat, <laughs> uh, but a, I don't know what that is. I don't know how to do that, but the way that I tie my tie, you're allowed to do on Shabbat. Okay. Um, so tying a professional knot of that kind. Also, uh, matir, untying a knot of that kind is also forbidden on Shabbat. Because when you untie it, then you have your threads, it's open. It's, it's also productive because you now um, can have those threads available for something else. You can retie them in a different way, in a better way. Um, toe fair. Toe fair is sewing. Sewing is forbidden in Shabbat. You can't sew in Shabbat. Um, some questions about sew so sewing. We you know what sewing is. Other ways of adhesing two things together. Uh, is subject to some debate. So what about tape? Is tape prohibited because of is it a form of sewing or not? How is tape, taping one thing to another similar to sewing? How is it different? So it's similar, you have two things that are now attached. It's different because taping something is kind of, it's not very permanent, you can pull it apart again very easily. So depending on how strong the tape is, it other would or wouldn't be a problem. But using a safety pin to pin slings, is that toe fair, is that sewing? Uh, kind of, because your the needle goes through, it kind of, it's like sewing. Uh, but maybe not, because a safety pin you can just undo uh, 
What about closing a package? Closing a package, like what, for example? Like if you're taking a box. Yeah, so it'll probably be, if it's meant to be permanent, like it's going to tape it up and it's going to stay in that state for like the next three weeks as it goes to the mail, that might be a problem. Or if you have foods in your house that have those like automatic adhesive tabs, you want to close it open. So the automatic adhesive tabs, I would say, would not be a problem because the way that they're meant to be operated is open and close, open and close, open and close. Whereas when you tie up the package, it's meant to stay closed kind of indefinitely, or at least for like a couple weeks until the package gets to right. China, wherever you're sending it to. Yeah. Okay, a baby diaper is probably okay because, again, it's only meant to be, it's, it won't stay very, like you know, the, little, the, the sticky parts of the diaper, mm -hmm. it won't stay all that long, and it's meant to be undone. Okay, these are all the type of things, you know, we, the, the point right now is not for us to go into every single detail of these rules, uh, but this is the type of thing that, these are, this is the type of um, judgments that are, that, that Jewish law loves and develops, okay, as, as these applications multiply and you know, all the stuff we have in our modern world. Okay, the easiest thing is to not do anything. Shabbat. So that's not the point. That's not, <laughs> I think the point is not to do nothing. No, no, I mean, like, if you're not sure, like, don't take like, the, the risk yet. Yeah. So you can verify after Shabbat, but it can, if it's not a matter of life, it can wait for Sunday. So that's often true. I, 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 think that, that, I appreciate that. I would just say um, Shabbat is also supposed to be like here's, here's the thing, there's, there's no, if you're strict about one thing, that requires you being lenient about something else. So if I'm very strict and I'm not going to have warm food or not going to change my baby's diaper or not going to, like, the, the more strict you are in one, in one area, that means you're being lenient in something else because, like, Shabbat is supposed to be a really pleasant day. It's supposed to be a day where our homes are clean, where our bodies are clean, where we're eating good food and enjoying being with our family and our community and praying and all that. And if my baby's diaper isn't changed in 24 hours and I'm not eating good food and, you know, et cetera, et cetera, and I'm cold and I'm hungry, you know, like that's not, that's also a problem, right? So, so I think the answer is, you're right, you should be cautious, and it's, but the answer is to, uh, to read more, to study. If you don't know, you know, you should have a reference book. If you don't know, am I allowed to mash my avocados to make guacamole? Uh, I don't know, let me look that up in this reference book I have on my shelf, right? Like that, or, you know, let me, I'll speak to the rabbi, you know, uh, when I go to sh synagogue Shabbat morning, before I go home and make my lunch, and he can tell me how I can make my salad in this way, right? So, so it's better to ask. Better to ask and to research and to learn, so that you can have like a day that's enjoyable and pleasant and nice, and also um, is uh, careful about all these restrictions, so that you create that special time for the day. Okay. Um, next, um, Korea. Korea is tearing. Tearing is also so just as sewing is forbidden, so too is tearing, but only tearing that's productive. If you tear in anger, that's you haven't violated Shabbat. If you tear something in a destructive way, you haven't violated Shabbat. But if you tear something in order to be able to uh, make something else or to reconnect it in a way that's better for you, then that would be a violation of Shabbat. Quick question, mm -hmm. and again, please stop me if I'm just derailing you. Why can you untie, right? It would seem like a diminution of value. Good, so I'd be untying for the sake of um, maybe getting access to something or untying the way that's productive. If it's just, you know, you have this beautiful thing and now you just untie it, it all kind of falls apart, that would probably not be a biblical violation. But if you untie in a way that um, enables you to... So if you untie it so you can breathe, no good. If you untie it so you can eat a cookie, untie a box, you can eat a cookie. So you have a double Windsor... Double Windsor. Double Windsor, double yeah. Windsor tie, so... I don't know, untying it allows you to preserve the tie. It allows you to, right, the tie doesn't get ruined because it's not too long. You untie it so you can have a better night. That, that would be, I think, enhancing to the utility of the tie that you can take it off and put it away at night. But it's like a permanence question. Like, permanently makes the tie more valuable versus, like, versus I can breathe now or, like, untying this bow allows me to eat the food inside this box. Or those whatever. might also be. Those are also enhancing, it, right? The only thing, but those are all, I think, would be problematic because they're all adding utility by the untying, as opposed to um, somebody, I, I go up to my, as a prank, I untie someone's shoes, and now they trip and they fall, right? I, I decrease the utility of their shoe by untying so them. Which is what outcome do you wish? And what, outcome, and what is the outcome? Is it increasing utility or decreasing utility? So if the tearing increases utility, that would be a biblical violation. If the tearing is just out of anger, it wouldn't be. Or, for, or destructive, right? Kid tears paper, that's not a violation of Shabbat. But if you're tearing paper because you want to use the little pieces of paper for something, that would be a violation. So tearing toilet paper is just an example. Uh, 
you know, you could say, the re many are strict and don't tear toilet paper on Shabbat, and we try in our community to always have, like, to encourage everyone to have um, either pre-cut toilet paper in your bathroom or like a box of tissues or something like that, because if you tear the toilet paper, you're, that, that enhances the utility of the, I'm sorry to be, you know, graphic, but that, that, that's how it's used, right? And that enhances the utility, because you don't really, you don't really care about like this particular square or like you know I, you know I don't really care if it's six inches or eight inches or four inches, but that, that part doesn't matter to me. But I do want a smaller piece of this toilet, of this roll of paper, in order for it to have add utility for me. So those who are strict, which is you know we encourage in this community, we tear in advance or we just put, put a box of tissues in the bathroom. Uh, tearing a piece of aluminum foil, right? By tearing the foil or the saran wrap. Like that makes it more useful. That that, that increases utility. So. Mm -hmm. So next, uh, trapping trapping an animal. Okay, um, trapping an animal is forbidden. Uh, this is not something we do all that often. Although, yeah, you can't. Um, uh, if there's a fly buzzing around, you're gonna do like that. Um, if it's a spider, you're gonna take a cup and put it on it. Okay. That would be except trapping an animal. The essential biblical way the, the, is when you, you trap the animal because you want the animal itself to eat or to use its skin for parchment. Whereas if you trap a spider, it's because you it's scaring you and you don't want the spider. Okay, so there's probably kind of lenient if you trap a spider that you don't want because that's not the biblical definition. But if you trap an animal that you want for some reason because you want to eat it or because you want to use its skin for making parchment. Uh, or leather, that would be prohibited. Um, the next step, after you've trapped the animal, is, is to slaughter the animal, to shatter it, to kill the animal. That's also prohibited. You can't kill an animal on Shabbat. Um, certainly an animal you want to eat or use its, use its body for making something. Um, nor do we cause bloodshed. So even you can't floss, it's going to make your gums bleed, okay? That's, a much minor thing <laughs> compared to killing an animal, but causing that blood is a derivative a subcategory of the broader category of slaughtering the animal. Okay, that's doing shit attack. Yeah. How sort of micro does this go? So if I'm picking up something heavy, I'm technically tearing muscle fibers. So generally in Jewish law, across the board, things that you can't see, we just, we, we don't are not subject to these restrictions. Mm -hmm. So like we don't the fact that they are a little yeah, there are microbes in the water. Like, we don't care about that, right? If you can't see it with a naked eye, we don't care the fact. So, yeah, the tearing, you know, what you're, the in internal bleeding or whatever, whatever, you can't see it, you're not aware of it, it doesn't count. Is it like an originalism thing where we place ourselves in the, you know, the spot where someone at the time of the Torahs... I don't think, you know, I, look, no one knew about this. It's like when when, my, when uh, telescopes and microscopes were invented, like, people had to deal with this, and like the consensus that emerged was things you can't see don't count. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if it's original. I think they were aware that there were... Like other scientific standards don't apply either, or they, yeah, they I mean, do... Yeah, even in the times of the Talmud, they were, like, the phrase they used was called lo nitnat Torah l'malach right? The Torah was not given to angels. Meaning, the Torah is given to people, and people are imperfect. So, like, what a normal person can see and, and be careful about and be aware of, that's what the Torah you know, is concerned about, and things that, you know, so even in the times of the time where it wasn't, it wasn't about microscopes, it was about, you know, uh, you should wear a tefillin in the middle of your head. But like, how, do you have to like, take a ruler and measure it? Like, you know, like how, like, no, you know, just like, just look at it and estimate it and do the best you can. You don't have to like, take out a ruler and, and, and get it, you know, defined, right? The term is like, into angels, into people, and that, that's the kind of thing. And what is exercising fall under? Actually, exercising is not one of these three main categories, but it, is maybe a different category. We'll get there. We'll, we'll, we'll get to it again. Okay, a little more complicated, um, but it's not a problem because any of any of these things. That's it's not it's not no. nothing we've seen so far. Um, okay, can't trap animals. Okay, but again, if it's a scary animal and you're trapping it not because you want it but because you don't want it, then that would probably be okay. It's certainly a, not a biblical violation. It might actually be okay because if you're worried about it biting you, then that would override. It's rabbinic prohibition to begin with because you're not trapping it because you want it. And since it's a rabbinic prohibition and a biblical prohibition, we say, the, well, the rabbis 
didn't extend their prohibition to a situation where you're frightened of the animal who's going to bite you. So if there's a, a bee, you can put the cup on the bee. It's, you know, at, at a picnic, on Shabbat, or in a sukkah, and there's a bee, you can take a cup and trap the bee so it doesn't bite you. You're not, okay? Even though, uh, in a different, if you were collecting bees for, I don't know, for like a scientific research, that would be a biblical prohibition. But if it's, you're not collecting bees, and a bee is bothering you, and you're scared of it, you can put a cup on it. And Sorry, oh, sorry, sorry, I went back. To capture, trapping, shechting, slaughtering, which also includes causing bleeding or wounding any animal or a person. Um, surgery, I guess, would be prohibited for this reason. Uh, we override that prohibition, like all prohibitions, if life is in danger, but we wouldn't do elective surgery on Shabbat because the cutting, the incision, is a derivative of shrita. Again, shrita is killing and surgery is healing, but a derivative of the act of slaughtering is making an incision. So there's no, you don't do elective surgery on Shabbat. Okay, mafshi. Mafshi is when you, after you've slaughtered the animal, you then spread out its skin to like dry it, because you're going to use the hide to make parchment of some kind. Next comes ma'abed, that's processing the hide to make leather or to make parchment. Uh, next comes nemafik, that's smoothing out the skin to remove the hairs and make it ready for leather or for parchment. Uh, this also would be why we don't use soap on Shabbat. Because when we use a bar of soap, we're rubbing it and making it smooth and changing the shape of something solid through our rubbing, which is a derivative of, you know, a smoothing out for a leather, a uh, piece of leather that we're, that we're working. Um, Misharte is putting, um, scoring lines on the parchment that we're going to use to write on. Okay, this is, again, these are, these are also pretty technical with few derivatives, few applications outside of the technical original context. And then the final one, and then is mechatech um, is then cutting it into pieces. Very similar to korea. Korea is tearing, mechatech is cutting. Uh, similar, uh, very kind of sim similar types of actions. And then comes writing and erasing. Okay, once you have your parchment and you have the scores and you've cut it into the shape you want and the size you want, Writing is prohibited and erasing is prohibited if you're erasing so that you can write something else. If you're erasing as an act of destruction, that's not a biblical violation. But if you're erasing so you can rewrite something in that spot where you erased, that's a biblical violation because that's a productive um, adding utility, right? Your parchment is worth more because you've erased this thing you don't want and now you can write something you want. Aren't you just not supposed to be writing anyway? On Shabbat, maybe. Yeah. Yes, that's that. But even if you were erasing it to write on it exactly. the following day. Exactly. Oh. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Right? They're, they're each they're, they're each for the next. Or if you were counting how many violations someone did, you know, for some reason, right? You know. Right. At the time of the temple, people brought sacrifices to the temple if they violated Jewish law in certain ways. So uh, you would have to know. It was important to know that you violate three times or five times or one time, right? So that's also a reason why it would be important to know these things. You know, uh, nowadays, we try to do the best we can. We don't, you know, it doesn't... The, the number of prohibitions is a little bit less relevant, you know. Okay. Bonin. Next is building. So all, all of these, this whole series culminates in writing, okay? So it's trapping the animal and then doing all the things that you do to its skin to make parchment and then writing or erasing. That's all the next series of Milachot, series, right? We have the series leading up in bread. Now we have the series leading up in writing something on parchment. And the next is about, um, like, homes. Uh, so bone is uh, building. You can't build on Shabbat. So building, what falls under building? Um, so some, some cases, I mean, you can't erect a tent. You can't, you know, build something um, like a structure. Uh, cases that are a little bit tricky. What about opening an umbrella? That was a book class discussion. Yes, yeah, so when umbrellas were invented, this was a great debate in Jewish law. And some said it's not building, and some said it is. And the common practice in Orthodox communities is not to use umbrellas on Shabbat. And, but the truth is, when umbrellas were invented, this was a debate, and there were multiple opinions, and they're both pretty, you know, have what to say about them. And, but, right, it's like, a, it's an umbrella like a little miniature tent that you carry around with you. Is that, is that how you would understand an umbrella or not? That, that's basically what it comes down to. Um, what about a folding chair? Can I open and close a folding chair? That's exactly what I was thinking of. Good. So generally we say, yes, you can, because when I, 
when I open a folding chair, am I, I'm not really building a chair, I'm operating the folding chair. <laughs> a folding chair is meant to be open and closed. A folding table is meant to be open and closed. That's the way, like, that it's, it was complete before you opened and closed it. You didn't complete it when you opened it. It was complete when it was folded. So it had a valuable state in either position, it was whereas complete. It was an like, umbrella it was is useless when it's closed. Yeah, that's that's good. Yeah, the, also it's the umbrella. Maybe there's a different parameter. Maybe the parameter of making a shelter when you open the umbrella maybe is a little bit different uh, than uh, opening a folding piece of furniture, which is meant to be open and closed, open and closed. That's how it works. What about... Um, what about flipping a switch which completes a circuit? Have I built a circuit when I turn on my light or turn on my radio by completing the circuit? Or is that more akin to the folding chair, open and close, open and close? This also is a debate with electricity. Like, what is, how do we categorize electricity on Shabbat? There were some who said that any time you operate an electronic device and you complete a circuit, that's akin to building something because it wasn't complete before, and you turn the switch, and now the circuit is closed, and now it's complete. The response was no, like it was complete before, you're just operating the switch. You're not building a radio, you're just turning it on, you're not turning it off. You're not building and destroying a radio every time you turn the switch on and off. It's like two optimal states versus... Two optimal states, good, right? It was a complete, intact object that has to be turned on and off, open and close the floating chair. What if you've actually hired um, people who build for your work? Great question. And they typically operate Great on question. Saturday. Good question. So that's like a separate category. That's a question of like if you hire somebody else to do work, like what what's, what are your responsibilities? Seems like it would probably not be. <laughs> it depends. Good. It depends. It depends on the terms of your hiring. Then, you, if you, as a general rule, you're allowed to. I can drop off my close at the dry cleaners on Thursday and say, I'll pick it up on Monday. And I don't care when they do it. They might do it on Shabbat. They might do it on Friday. They might do it Sunday. I don't really care. I don't really know. That's permissible. What I can't do is ask them to do it for me on Shabbat. So that's one thing to keep in mind. If, they're, if their terms of employment is that they are like contractors as opposed to like your employee, then they can do it basically whatever they want as long as they have the, as long as you're not telling them to do it for you on Shabbat. Right. When it comes to real estate, we tend to be a little bit stricter because yeah. you, you that they're doing it, they're doing the work on your property, right. which is associated with you, and so we're a little bit stricter. So there are some leniencies, but we're generally stricter about work done on your property, which everyone who passes by will think that you ask them to do it on Shabbat for you because. What if it's a rental property and they decided to mourn them, you know? Mm -hmm. The, uh, oh, you're right. So that's not you. It's the landlord who, meaning that's not that's not your choice anyway. So. But even if it's my property and I own it, but they decided uh, to like mourn the loan, is it okay? Sure your, your tenants? Yeah. Yeah, of course. Because <laughs> everyone knows. Everyone knows that tenants <laughs> get. It's a separate class. Because everyone, everyone, know, everyone know that tenants get to uh, mow the loan whatever they want, right? That's okay. no, no one think that you that you ask them to do it on Shabbat. Yeah, all these cases, they get their complicated cases. Sometimes there are, you know, sometimes it could be if, you, if you're if you renovating your kitchen and it's going to take you three weeks and you tell them don't work on Saturdays then, or, or it's the holiday season, don't work on Saturdays, don't work on the holidays, they may say, you know what, I'm going to do the next job first because I forget about it. And then by the time they get around to you, it's like up three months later and you need to renovate this kitchen because you are renting it out to somebody else and you could lose a three months rent because they, you know, right, it, they could be... Got it. Um, okay, next. Um, uh, destroying. So just as building is, uh, so too is destroying, if the destroying is done in a productive way. Why would destroying be productive? Let's say you're, oh, great. good, you're demolishing a house to build a new house. Exactly. Exactly. Um, and, uh, yeah, exactly. It's a racing. Wait, that is... That is, what did you just say? If you're destroying in a productive way, okay. that's a biblical prohibition. So the example was you're demolishing a building to build a new building there. So the demolishing itself is a prohibition, not just a biblical prohibition. Good. Um, maka bepatish. Maka bepatish means the final hammer blow. This is 
you know, maybe want to craft and build something. Um, she takes a hammer and this little pin, just to test that it's done, or the final little nick to the object that's been created to signify that it's done. That is also a, um, like one of these prohibitions. It's like any final thing that makes something useful. So maybe tuning a guitar might be not good about it, or replacing a string on a guitar. Um, it was useless before. You put the string on, you tune it, now you have something that's useful. The final, you know, uh, um, you're, you're at a concert, you're setting up the sound system, plugging in the microphone, adjusting it, that might be my good practice. You're s setting up and erecting this, this system, which now is complete. Um, so the final iron blows. So some people also thought maybe, you know, turning on a switch is not good practice. Some said, no, it was useful before. Right? That, that's another thing that was suggested in the great electricity debates. Um, when did those happen? All through the 19th and 20th century. Did they come to, so within the Orthodox world, did they come to different conclusions? They, different did, jurisdictions? they did. It comes to electricity out of different jur jurisdictions, but different a number of different opinions emerged. One very dominant and very strict one was the opinion that electricity is like bone, it's like building, you're creating, you're, you're, when you turn the switch on, you like built a radio. Um, the other opinion that, I, that was my teachers really emphasized and that seems most compelling to me is that electricity doesn't really fit into any one of these 39 categories. Rather, it's just a very strong custom not to use electricity on Shabbat, um, which, which is very wise because, as we've seen, most of these 39 categories, we don't do them anyway, even during the week. Like when was the last time you um, winnowed sheared or sheared. sheared a sheep? Like, never, right? So. So not doing them on Shabbat doesn't make the day all that different, but not using a computer and a phone and a TV like that defines the day as a really different, special day where you're not distracted, you're not pulled in all different directions, you can focus on yourself and your family and your community. So it's so important. So it it's, can't really be pigeonholed into any one of these 39 categories of labor. It's not really building, it's not really um, the final hammer blow. It doesn't really work in any of those categories, but the universal practice among observant Orthodox Jews not to use electronic devices on Shabbat is so very important as to find the day as if it's separate and different. Now it could be, now, the electronic device could do something that's forbidden, like if you use an electronic um, uh, shearer to shear a sheep, like that's still shearing a sheep. Exactly. Using an electronic lawnmower to cut the grass, that's cutting the grass, that's still, that's still a biblical prohibition, but the electronic device per se that isn't doing anything like computer or a phone that's not actually doing anything biblically prohibited per se, uh, just other than the use of electricity itself, um, probably can't be put into one of these categories of labor, but it's still a universal have time to do it and a really, really valuable one, right? I, really, like, I think it's probably more important than some of these in terms of making the day different. And that's not the first time that happened. In the, the Talmud records that, we're jumping ahead a little bit, so we'll get to this eventually on the sheet, but the Talmud records that in the Talmudic period, when Jews made that transition from being mostly farmers, which is the case in the biblical period, to being mostly people who lived in cities, merchants or artisans or whatever, um, they realized, oh, like we're not doing most of this stuff even during the week. Shabbat is kind of the same as the weekday since we don't do this stuff anyway. <coughs> let's make some additional restrictions. So let's not uh, buy and sell anything, which is not one of these 39 categories. Um, but let's, let's make a rabbinic decree not to handle money, not to buy and sell anything, not to exchange uh, ownership of things. Uh, let's have laws of mukta. Let's not even move or handle things that have no Shabbat purpose so that Shabbat will be more distinctive and more different and more restful. Are, are these um, <coughs> Duraisa or Duravana? Well, the three nine categories are Duraisa, but they all have Duravanan extensions and right. So I've been defining like the Duraita biblical definition. Uh, if you do it in a different way, if you do it in a permanent way, if you do it in this without some of the necessary qualifications, then it would be Duravanan. So I'm always curious, like, to what degree are these supposed to be like supra temporal, right? Like, should we be able to intuit out or subspeciate all these things to all the things we do today that are meant not to be done? So, so I think many of them, yes, but I think some of them, like electricity or, you know, like it, it's, it's a little bit hard if it, when it doesn't work, but... Uh, it's like attenuated, but... Yeah, I mean, there's another, there's a, here's the, okay, so another, another uh, the Torah says, it makes reference to Shabbat, it uses the word Shabbaton, 
which seems to be like a day of rest. And in the Middle Ages, a rabbi named um, Ramban, uh, Rabbi Moshe ben Nachman, known as Nachmanides, he <coughs> wrote he, in his commentary on the Torah, said this word Shabbaton, right, Shabbat should be a restful day, he says that means that separate from and aside from these 39 categories of labor, we also have an obligation to make sure that the day is a restful day. So even though I, I can study the 39 categories of labor for years and years, and there's no prohibition against moving furniture from the attic to my basement and back and forth and back and forth. You, like, don't do that. That's because the day is supposed to be restful. Um, and so these 39 categories are meant to teach us, but, but they're not, they're like a floor without a ceiling, right? Mm -hmm. So that's also where exercise maybe gets in. Mm -hmm. So uh, it might not be one of these 39 categories later, but the day is supposed to be tranquil, supposed to be focused on family and community and, and prayer and eating, you know, meals and, you know, you know and so maybe, you know, uh, and, and wearing nice clothes and et cetera. So maybe sports would not fit in with that. So maybe a friendly, you know, catch, you know, with your nephew would be fine. But like, you know, you put on, you put, like putting on shorts and a t-shirt and playing football, maybe that would not be, right? Mm -hmm. Because in terms of uh, getting muddy and sweaty and jerk, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, so it, there's a lot, there's a, even with all the rules and all the details of these rules, there's still a need for intuition and for common sense and for kind of asking questions like, you know, is, is this in the spirit of Shabbat? Is this the kind of tranquil day that I want to cultivate? Um, and these 39 categories and all the rules and the details of those rules um, help us to make those kind of judgments, but ultimately we still have to kind of make those decisions like, is this restful? Is this in the spirit so of the day? I have a question. Yeah. So you're allowed to read on Shabbat, right? Yes. So you're allowed to read the newspaper for that time? Good question. So, so maybe, uh, you know, um, um, there's a prohibition against reading contracts and documents, lest you, you know, come and write on them and make innovations and edits. So certain types of reading is not appropriate. Uh, newspaper it has, is, is sort of in that gray area where some would say no, it should day about you should focus on. Uh, um, Studying Torah and reading religious texts only, and you know, uh, with the other argument say no, it's it's relaxing, you enjoy it, it right? So it really depends on how you enjoy the newspaper, you know, how you read it, you know, maybe if you, uh, you know, for a period of time I didn't read, I didn't I only read the newspaper like sitting in bed with my wife because I felt that was not that was like a, the activity was you know a kind of like bonding with my wife, you know, we're sitting and reading together in bed, like that was sort of like a, that seemed to me in the spirit of Shabbat, whereas like reading the newspaper alone didn't seem to be in the spirit of Shabbat. The newspaper has some other issues because it gets printed on Shabbat, it gets delivered on Shabbat, so you have some other issues you have to work out as well, like how, how you get to it, how you get the newspaper if it's that day's paper. Um, so I would say how you feel, so if it Because you know in Israel it's very common that people have like Shabbat edition, exactly. you know, so... No, because they get it on Friday, I mean that comes on Friday. They get it on Friday, exactly, exactly. but exactly. it's like a huge edition, yeah, of course. people see them read it throughout the Shabbat. Yeah, yeah, but, those are, but that, I would say, look, those, like the literary supplement, it has to be very Torah, it has all sorts of things, it has, you know, deeper analysis, but again, yeah, I think it depends on how you, I think if you were to say it's fine, you would say, yeah, I'm, I'm contemplating ideas that are inspiring to me and important to me, I'm learning about the world, I'm, you know, and, and uh, my, my mind is being expanded by these things I'm discovering, you know, that would be a reason to say yes. The reason to say no would say, you know, no, you're, you're, you're reading gossip about so celebrities, so you're reading you know, advertisements, you're looking at the stock you know, market, you know, like, it's not, you know, like, do that yeah. stuff. You know, so I think it depends on what you're reading and what it means to you. Would, would have, okay. yeah. um, so, Again, there's a lot of literature on this. Is that there's a lot of literature on this? Um, I'm also but, because but, I have an argument with my father about it because they keep Shabbat. They don't yeah, cook, they yeah. don't drive, they don't do anything, yeah. no TV, no nothing. But it's still holding newspaper. Yeah. So okay. and you can read it to me. Like, so I was like, I can't listen to this. I was like, anyway, what's the cost of that? So there are, there are. I think they can be justified because you would say it's not. You know, he's reading about things that expand his mind. He feels are important to know that uh, it's relaxing and enjoyable for him to sit in his chair and read his. Some Shabbat supplement, you know, that comes in. Um, yeah, but 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 you know, if you but if you decide for yourself, no, Shabbat, like I don't want to be thinking about those things. It's too stressful. It's too upsetting. Uh, there's no good news anyway. Like let me, I'll read the I'll read Torah, I'll read philosophy, I'll read a novel. You know, I'll read the newspaper. I can read newspaper. I can read you know. Other Every days. day. Yeah. yeah, other day. Exactly. Exactly. Um, 
Three more, okay? And then we'll pause. Um, lighting a fire and extinguishing a fire are the next two. Lighting a fire would also um, include um, uh, turning on a, like a combustion you know, an automobile, right? Which has a ignition. And, and the, not just the ignition, the, burning, the, the combustion, right? Exactly. Um, turning on a stove um, also falls under that. Okay, lighting a fire. Extinguishing a fire as well. Extinguishing a fire that was only a biblical revision that enhances utility. How could extinguish a fire enhance utility? If you extinguish a fire, you now have a wick that you can that more easily lights the next time. If you extinguish a fire just because you're just done with the fire, then it's actually not a biblical prohibition. The biblical prohibition is extinguishing the fire in order to enhance utility, because now you have a wick that can more easily light the next time. Uh, I think some places people used to, you know, if you instead of demolishing their homes to rebuild their homes in some places, jurisdictions, they they can the fire that will come and set the house on fire so they can practice extinguishing it. That might also be, I don't know. Is that near? That might also be fun to that. Yeah, that, was a good, that was a thing that people did. Uh, <laughs> so, um, okay, but lighting fire, okay, lighting fires, extinguishing fires is prohibited. And finally, hutza'a uh, is moving something. This is kind of the strangest of all these categories because you're not actually changing the item at all, but you're moving it from place to place. So from a public domain to a private domain, from a private domain to a public domain, or within a public domain, carrying something is prohibited. Um, uh, we, if it's not a full public domain, like a major urban center where hundreds of thousands of people congregate, like an ancient city square, but just like a little semi-public domain, like a contemporary neighborhood in most of our cities, uh, there's a way to get around this prohibition by constructing an area, like a symbolic enclosure of the neighborhood. And with boundaries that we construct or that exist. Kind of like a detour, sort of? Not a detour, it's a. Uh, so so it's a certain route, you mean? No, 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 no. Um, if we say that, look, so the, the biblical prohibition, you can't, can't get around the biblical prohibition. You can't carry from your house to the public domain or from the public domain to the house or more than four cubits, more than six feet in the public domain. But, but a public domain we define as a place where the public, like hundreds of thousands of people, congregate, like a, you know, like in the ancient world where, where cities had streets that went right from one end of the city to the other. You think of like a classic Roman city, that streets that went straight across the city. Um, a public domain like that, that's biblical, you can't carry there no matter what. But if it's like a neighborhood that doesn't have major streets like that, a neighborhood like ours, you can enclose the neighborhood in a boundary. Oh, I see. Like for example, the wall that goes along the metro tracks on Ravenswood, and the seawall that goes along um, the lakefront and some wires that we have strung up along Irving Park and along Fullerton and Diversity. And now our neighborhood is actually all enclosed. And so it's like one giant private domain in certain ways. And so we can carry. And so in our neighborhood, we have an A roof. It's called an A roof. It's like a, a combination of all of these private domains into one larger private domain. And we're allowed to carry uh, on Shabbat inside in our neighborhood. That's, that's what an A roof does. So our neighborhood and hundreds of other Jewish neighborhoods across the country now have these enclosures around the entire neighborhood, which enables us to carry in Shabbat. So you can push a baby stroller, you can carry your it's keys in your pocket. It's not actual physical It's an enclosure. actual physical enclosure. Oh, it is a physical yeah. We use existing enclosures for the most part. I see. And then we use other things that are very small that no one else notices, like wires that we string up between them. Oh. So you wouldn't know where is the boundaries? Yeah, the we have a map. We have a map on the yeah. city website. We have a map in the Shul lobby. And oh. it gets checked every week to make sure it's intact. Either have a border or you don't. Yeah, I meaning sometimes, uh, I mean, things happen. I mean, they do construction. They, they're constant. It's a big area, and there's constant change because the city is replacing, you know, telephone poles and uh, buildings are going up and buildings are going down. But yeah, we, we have them. Yeah. Okay, let's pause here. Um, this was a lot. <laughs> um, next time we'll, we'll go in detail in cooking and heating warm food, and then we'll talk about some of these other categories. Six, seven, eight, nine. We'll probably handle the next one or two sessions, okay? And then we'll go and let her see and talk about some of the like religious parts of Shabbat. Um, uh, and these readings are all recommended, and you know that are in that section. So. Um, the next.
session might actually be on the calendar already. And I just, the next time we're meeting might be... The 27th. 27th. Sorry. 27th, 8 o'clock. 27th we're meeting back at the synagogue, and we're meeting at 8 o'clock. So that's our next session. Thank you so much. See you soon. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Bye. 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 Bye